Hello and welcome to Newsroom Series. Today, I'm Olumide Mokoli. We're bringing you happenings from the southeast region of the country. First are the top stories of the day. There was pandemonium in the Kaduna state capital earlier today as police operatives tried to disperse members of the proscribed Islamic movement of Nigeria who held a procession this, in uh, the city center. Diamond uh, members had gathered along the Katsina roundabout by Amadu Belowe before the police arrived. This created panic and fear amongst the residents. No go far away from your house. The Federal High Court in Lagos has convicted controversial cross-dresser and social uh, media uh, persona Idris Okune, known popularly as Babriski, for abusing the Naira. Justice Abimbola Awogworo convicted him following his guilty plea and the review of the facts of the case against him. Before his conviction, he pleaded with the court he was not aware of the law and abusing the Naira, to which he also replied, I know my lord, I wish you can give me another chance to use my platform to inform and educate my followers about spraying money. In Plata State, the crisis rocking the House of Assembly continues as the Speaker has sworn in nine out of 16 members cleared by the appeal court as lawmakers. The Speaker, Mr. Gabriel Duan, performed the brief swearing ceremony in the early hours of today at the temporary chambers where the House has been sitting with only nine members taking the oath. The Speaker was not clear on the criteria for swearing in of the nine members who are members of the APC, nor the reason for leaving out seven remaining lawmakers. Meanwhile, the APC chairman in the state, Arufus Bature, says it's a violation of the democratic tenets. Operatives of the Nigerian Navy ship Pathfinder have arrested suspects in connection with a massive illegal refining operation in the creeks of River State. The commander, Commodore Desmond Igbo, says the illegal refining site has the capacity to produce an estimated 9.6 million liters of crude. The site is wellhead is 15. Uh, the site is the wellhead 15, part of the NPCL's OML 18. And the commander says he and his men will continue to fight crude oil theft to a standstill. Afterwards, the Navy handed over the suspects to the NSCDC for prosecution. And now we delve into Newsroom Southeast, creation of additional states for the Southeast, restructuring the need for state police, local government autonomy, and more recognition for traditional leaders are the major talking points during the town hall meeting of the review of the 1999 constitution. During the town hall meeting in Owiri, the Imo State Capital, a member of the review committee and the federal lawmaker representing the federal constituency says the House of Representatives is committed to ensuring that the current process of amending the Nigerian constitution does not suffer the fate of previous exercises. Our correspondent, Ito Pekuti. Reports. It's a town hall forum organized by the House of Representatives Committee on the review of the 1999 Constitution to engage Nigerians at all levels on the changes they would like to see. Meeting is coming just over a month after the inauguration of the sixth special committee on the review of the 1999 Constitution. Their mandate is to harness input of all Nigerians at the senatorial district levels through open forums, public consultations and digital platforms, ensuring that their voice is heard and considered. Seated here are traditional rulers, religious leaders, women and youth groups, as well as community leaders from Mbitoli Ikedru Federal Constituency. A member of the Constitutional Review Committee representing Imo State, Akarachi Abmadi, speaks on the importance of taking seriously the exercise, urging the people to speak up and make their own contributions. It is very critical that we look at every part of the Constitution analytically to be sure that the Constitution truly represents our interest. There might be a lot of things that I wish as a House member I can do for our people, but I cannot step outside what the Constitution allows me to do. One after another, representatives of the various groups make their contributions on what they think should be amended in the 1999 Constitution. We have to talk about the necessity of having state police, community police, 
early town vigilantes that will help to curtail the high level of insecurity we are facing in Nigeria today. What we see at the local government level is appointed and not elected. They are not executive. They don't, they are, their powers are limited. So if there shall be local government election where the chairman there should be executive chairman of the local government, he should have power to employ to hire and fire. Mr. Amadi notes their inputs while promising that the exercise is not another jamboree and the committee would deliver. So I show them that this is not a jamboree. There was no incentive for me to do this, but because of the passion, because of the needs of our people, we decided to do this. And we will make sure that we make this memorandum see the light of day from our federal constituents. The consensus is that the views raised will be considered as some pressing issues that have emerged in the nation's polity. These issues will be considered alongside those from other regions as the committee raises to conclude its work by the end of 2025. Iyito Channel of Television News. The Southeast Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, comprising Anambra, Enugu and Eboi branches, have organized a stakeholders engagement meeting to interact with manufacturers on how to access funds to enhance their businesses and also solve issues common to the business communities. According to the chairman of the Association for the Zone, Mrs. Ada Chuku Doze, for private businesses to thrive, support from the government agencies and financial institutions is very necessary, as well as keen into technology. The meeting with the theme, access to finance and cheaper funding for small and medium enterprises in Nigeria takes place at the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria liaison office in Onicha, Anambra State. <laughs> Presenting her address, Chairman of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria for Anambra, Enugu and Ebonyu States, Mrs. Adachuku Dozie, notes that the summit will explore various means of accessing funds, support big, medium and small businesses in the southeastern region. The focus is on access to finance and sources of funds to various financial institutions and government agencies in a bid to understand how to access cheap funds to support manufacturers and businesses within the region. This has attracted various categories of financial institutions from the continental to the national and to the local levels. Beyond funding, she believes the business owners must also embrace technology to improve their business outcomes. The marketplace has evolved from the physical market to a hybrid physical and digital space. There is a need to understand this way of doing business from the digital Gateway platform and space. Meanwhile, the director of compliance of the Afrexim Bank urges the business community to embrace the partnership with financial institutions to turn businesses around on the African continent. Not that we don't have the instruments, not that we don't have the tools, but what is holding us back? It's just for us to wake up from that our slumber, take the bull by the horn and make sure we deliver on this important mandate of transforming Africa and transforming Africa's food. Transforming our goods, our raw materials into finished goods for exports of better, of better revenue. So the call is on of us. Yes. To kickstart this process is the signing of a memorandum of understanding by Smeden and financial institutions to ensure that access to fund is possible. We as an agency have also started some interventions. We're here in Anambra State and um, special thanks to His Excellency the Governor of Anambra State who will sign a memorandum of understanding to the tune of a billion naira where manufacturers and small businesses in Anambra State can access funds from as little as 250,000 to 2.5 billion naira at a single digit interest rate for working capital, for workplace procurement, and also for work equipment. More assurances are coming from the Anambra State government that it is ready to support small and medium businesses, appealing that they take advantage of available programs. The governor wants us to have 
a population that is productive at home and exportable abroad. So that's why we're here today, to enable people to see the future that is coming and to embrace it with confidence. The Southeast industrialists believe the future is bright for the nation's manufacturing sector if they get the necessary support from government at all levels to enhance the country's economic growth and ensure stability of the Naira. The Abia state government says the Dr. Alex Oti administration did not obtain any loan facility to liquidate the 9.5 billion Naira pension arrears accumulated during the tenure of past administrations in the state, saying it cleared them from its savings. Speaking during an interview with journalists at the government house in Umahia, capital of Abia state, the commissioner for finance, Abia state, Mr. Mike Aquara, says Dr. Alex Oti administration's financial prudence in government has made it possible for the state to wipe the backlog of pension from government savings. We can see within nine, ten months what we call pure dividends of democracy. He felt so bad about what people passed through, most especially those people that served their states meritoriously and retired. So that was one of his campaign promises that he will right the wrong, that he will change the narrative of how things are, well, are being done in Nigeria. And this is exact, exactly what he has done. Sometime um, about last week uh, before Easter, we had to pay off areas of uh, pensions and commenced immediate payment of 100% of your pension come April. His prudency led to this. We did not borrow a dime to pay this money. To the credit of the governor, the man that has been running things and running it well, we did not borrow. We had to squeeze it from our both internally generated revenue and other sources that we accrue to us as a state. And that we have done perfectly well. You're watching Newsroom series. Coming up, the Anogu State Governor speaks on delivery of quality education in the state. Please stay with us. Welcome back. A member of the Board of Trustees of the All Progressives Congress and the National Caucus of the Party, Prince Benjamin Apugo, has applauded the Abia State Governor, Dr. Alex Oti, for the positive turn of events in the state, saying that Abia has come to stay under him. Speaking during an interview with journalists after a private visit to the governor in his country home, an invoice in the local government area of the state, the strongman of Abia politics and a member of the highest advisory body of APC, lauded Dr. Alex Oti's leadership style, regretting that those who, com who governed Abia in the past 24 years, according to him, did not do well, saying that Governor Oti has done what he was expected to do. I'm happy about what is happening in my state. Before he won the election, I told Abia people to vote for him, not minding the position I have in my party. And I told Abia people that this man will bring us back to life. That's what I told them. And all of them listened to me. I never bothered uh, of a uh, candidate of APC because we had none. And what I've said, and what I said that time, is no longer myself alone now that will say it or is saying it. Everybody is saying it. Everybody is saying that I have come to stay. Because every other person that have governed this place for 24 years, they are all looters. The Enugu State Chapter, sorry, the Enugu State Governor, Mr. Peter B, has a short, Peter, Mr. Peter Mba, I beg your pardon, has assured residents that his government will do all it takes to deliver quality education in the state and increase the literacy rate amongst children from 50 to 100 percent in 2025. Governor Mba made this commitment in a town hall meeting with citizens of the state titled, The Issues of Governance, The Journey So Far, at the old government lodge in Enugu. Tackle the education, the crisis we have in the education sector frontally, and which is essentially what we have done. We are currently constructing the smart schools across the 260 local governments. 
We, sorry, 260 words. We've awarded the contract for 135. So in 135 words today, those smart school projects are ongoing. Now, before the end of before the end of next month, we're going to award the balance of the two, 125 wards. So we're going to... According to him, the state government is currently constructing smart schools across the 260 wards in Enugu State and will be fully operational by September 2025. The objective is to ensure that every Enugu State child gets equal or better education as his or her peers in Europe, America, and other developed parts of the world. We've identified all the indicators where we're challenged, whether it's the numeracy and the literacy rates, where we have currently about 50%. Our target is that by next year, we're going to move that to 100%. Where we have, and what we're doing in the smart school is almost for us, now, for more on this, we are joined on the program by the Commissioner for Education in Enugu State, Professor Wambui Zemba, who joins us via Zoom. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, the name is Professor Ndubwe Zemba. Oh, we do beg your pardon, Professor Ndubwe Zemba. Thank you for being with us. Now, a laudable plan by the state government of Enugu to create smart schools across the state. What got the government thinking in this direction? The um, governor of Enugu State, His Excellency Barrister Dr. Peter Ndubu Simba, in his evaluation of the sustainability and development challenges facing Enugu State, um, he identified education as the single most important um, intervention uh, program for um three areas of, of development as outlined in his um, statement of proposal manifesto from two years ago. And he has been steadfast and faithful to that uh, statement of purpose. And those three cross cutting areas is one in the area of um, GDP growth and manufacturing. Um, and the second sector is in the area of governance and the third sector is in uh, social service delivery. Of all the uh, sectors um, of the state, he identified education as the single most important that cuts across all of them, both in terms of um, creating a skilled workforce um, that will move Enugu from being, being a civil servant state to becoming a productive state um, to ensuring that we achieve a 0% poverty headcount um, from our current 48% uh, poverty headcount. Um, and also to achieve a, a radical GDP growth in a way that is sustainable from three, uh, from $4.4 billion per annum to $30 billion per annum. But beyond all of this, um, when we think about uh, social service delivery um, and the, um, the crisis of youth delinquency across the Southeast, as well as in other parts of Nigeria, uh, we, the, His Excellency sees education as the surest intervention. Um, he sees the investment in the child of today um, who is going to build us better roads, better hospitals, provide us better uh, facilities in the future as the most sustainable way to approach development in Africa. And so this is the idea behind the smart school, to bring together in one space um, the... Uh, technological interventions, uh, the modern forms of teaching, experiential teaching, experiential learning, um, and um, to, amb to ambient capacity among young people in that space to solve local problems. Okay. Um, and these local problems are often aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So, skill, okay, Professor. Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. We'll take a quick pause. I uh, would like to bring you the live press briefing by the Minister of Power, Mr. that is Mr. Adebayo Adelabu, which is holding in Abuja at the National Radio National Press Center, the radio house in the Central Business District in Abuja. And we'll be right back.
Now, Professor, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that answer. And that also begs the question, the smart schools, the public schools, are they going to be upgraded into smart schools or will the smart schools serve just a few? The, the smart school is, a com is part of a comprehensive uh, education uh, transformation agenda. Um, the smart schools that we're building now are going to serve every child in Enugu State who is in the basic school system. So that's from the age of three years old to the age of 14, 15 years old. That's from nursery one, two, three, through JSS three. So that is the complete basic school. And this smart school is completely free for every child in Enugu State. And there'll be 260 of these schools because we have 260 political wards in 17 local government areas in Enugu State. So it's, it's based on a simple principle of that, that no child will be left behind. But in after um, completing basic education, uh, the Enugu child will have access to smart senior secondary schools as well, which will serve um, 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 SS1 to SS3. Um, and for children who do not want to go to university, who want to pursue vocational skills and vocational education. At the completion of basic education at, at the level of JSS3, they will have the alternative choice of moving into one of 17 vocational uh, technical education programs that we have across the state as well. Um, so the smart school is not so much an infrastructure intervention as much as it is um, an education programmatic intervention that begins from uh, childhood education, early childhood education, all the way to tertiary education. And the program that we're running in these smart schools from basic to tertiary are called experiential education. It's where our kids learn by doing not just theoretically or hypothetically, we want to uh, make available to them the technologies, the amenities, uh, the facilities, the education resources, so they can put into practice what they learn inside the classroom, outside the classroom, all the way from early childhood to the tertiary institution. So the smart school is really um, the beginning of uh, a comprehensive and widespread um, um, an all-inclusive education reform in Enugu State. It is not just going to stop with the basic schools. It's also going to include the senior secondary, the vocational, and the tertiary institutions. Why do you call them smart schools? Uh, what are the components? Is it because of the use of computers? Thank you. This is a very good question. Um, the, you know, what makes a smart school? One is that the uh, physical infrastructure uh, ensures a safe, inclusive learning environment with access to learning resources, whether those learning resources are physical or material and proximate, or whether they are distant and electronic or digital. We want to make sure, and so the, the question of being smart, there is not so much the, the physical infrastructure or the equipment or technology, but what those things enable you to gain access to. So it's about the forms of knowledge, the forms of educational resources that, it, that are um, accessible through the smart school. That's what makes it smart. So we may not have uh, a certain uh, physical education resources, but we can be able to access them digitally. We can be able to access them electronically. Uh, we can have uh, a mechatronics uh, professor uh, from MIT uh, teach, and our students will be able to, um, you know, be participating in that lecture through their own class from their own classroom, right? So it's it's about access really that is important. That's what makes it smart. The second thing that makes it smart school is the teachers, the personnel, the people who are actually teaching and uh, and um, pioneering instruction and learning and how well these persons have been prepared. So we're talking about teachers so and how they teach. So smart schools are about moving from rote teaching and rote memorization to 
uh, experiential learning, learning by doing, learning uh, by practice, um, and developing 21st century skills, uh, as well as technological skills for the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, by 2050, a majority of the world global of the global youth are going to be in Africa. Now, the Africa's youth can be a deficit and a problem for the world, or they can be the solution for the world. And so what the governor of Enugu State is doing is that he has identified the children as the single most important intervention resource that we must invest in today to build up our human capacity um, for the fourth industrial revolution. So that is what the smart school is about. Yes, and we hope that uh, you are very successful in this endeavor, and we commend uh, you and the governor of Enugu State for this enterprise. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Now, finally, the Inter-Party Advisory Council in Ebony State has elected and inaugurated new leaders to pilot the affairs of the council in the state. The election took place at the Independent National Electoral Commission Collation Center in Abakaliki, the Ebony State capital, in the presence of the IPAC National Executive Committee, led by the national chairman, Yusuf Dantale, and observed by INEC officials and security agencies. In the peaceful election conducted, Mr. Anna Suaze emerged as the new state chairman and eight other executive members elected. The elected officials took the oath of allegiance and were inaugurated by the National Executive Committee of IPAC. The, newly, the new IPAC chairman promised credible leadership that will deepen democracy in the state. And that's Newsroom Series today with a focus on the Southeast. Thank you for watching. I'm Alumde McCall.